I really love it when that poor postured, no confidence person looking at the floor, when they come in, I want to take that person and I want to try to make them capable. Welcome to Forever White Belt. I'm your host, Adolfo Ferranda. Today on the show, we have Las Vegas black belt, Casey Milliken. Casey embarked on his journey into the world of jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai back in 2007. His dedication and passion for the martial arts led him to the fight scene, where he traveled the country as a professional MMA fighter. In 2017, he earned his black belt under the tutelage of Alexander Almeida. Casey is a connoisseur of fundamental jiu-jitsu, blending the wisdom of traditional techniques with the innovation of contemporary strategies. Not only does Casey excel in the realm of martial arts, but he also co-owns Tribe Fitness and Martial Arts right in the heart of Las Vegas, Nevada, a true embodiment of the fusion between old school principles and cutting edge methods. And hey, don't forget to check out Casey's fantastic Instagram and YouTube channels. There's a treasure trove of wisdom waiting for you, and trust me, you can learn a lot from them. And with that, I give you Casey Milliken. Casey, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. You're from Maine originally? Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you're in Las Vegas, correct? That's right. Okay. And you are the co-owner, I should say, of a Tribe Fitness and uh, Martial Arts? Yep. Tribe Vegas for short. My wife and I own it together. What's the culture of Tribe? The culture of Tribe is very much a family type atmosphere. My whole goal was to take a big box MMA gym and shrink it down into a much, you know, a much smaller footprint and um, also have a larger focus on community. The reason why is because I was part of a big box gym for a long time and it seemed like, uh, you know, if you did Muay Thai, you were a Muay Thai person. You didn't have anything to do with a Jiu Jitsu person. And you didn't have anything to do with a fitness person unless you were one of those kind of more rare people that trains in multiple disciplines. You know, I saw it as an opportunity to bring everybody together regardless of your goal. I do want you to touch on that a little bit, how your past gym experience informed how you planned the academy. Like, uh, I know you did sales at Planet Fitness, you were managing a syndicate MMA. Yeah, well, Planet Fitness was a great start because you learn a lot of the basic building blocks to any gym. Of course, it's a big corporate gym and a much smaller price point, but a lot of the basics are the same. Like one of the first things I ever learned was uh, a clean gym is a successful gym. And that always stuck with me, right? If you walk into a gym and it smells like shit, it's, it's, it's not a good first impression. And just working up at, at the front counter and learning, learning how to talk to people, because I was probably 17 when I first started working at Planet Fitness. So that was that was great experience and just learning how to talk to people and, and dealing with small issues and then kind of working your way up and getting some more experience. And then obviously an MMA gym is, is much different, but it was good to over the years be able to learn from all those experiences and build and build that and eventually my own gym. So I could take a lot of the guesswork out of it. Also, the, the aspect of you saying that it's a family atmosphere for that mm -hmm. kind of place, I would always associate that kind of place with like a kind of a tough guy kind of vibe. Absolutely. I, and that's a stigma that I think as an industry, we're all still trying to fight. Some of us are more in that fight than others. And what I mean is, I think certain gyms are purposely trying to create an atmosphere where they're trying to drive away the family type atmosphere. They want to attract up and coming professional fighters or aspiring fighters, and that's okay. The main thing is, um, I always say, if I can get somebody in the door, then I can change their mind about most stigmas after a conversation and a session. If I can get them through that first session, we can create a good enough experience where they're going to start to believe in the in jujitsu or Muay Thai, and they're going to see that they're not going to get their head taken off. Some people think they're going to be thrown to the wolves. And unfortunately, that's some people's experience too. It just depends on where you go. You know, my whole goal is to take the person who otherwise really wouldn't be able to defend themselves and just make them a hard target. The whole thing is like, I, I love working with athletes that have backgrounds that help them become exponentially better at jujitsu in a short amount of time. But I really love it when that poor postured, no confidence person looking at the floor, when they come in, I want to take that person and I want to try to make them capable. That's always my favorite person, the person, the quiet yeah. person in the back, who's maybe the smallest person. As a coach, that's the most rewarding thing about jujitsu for me. And uh, Tribe provides a lot of opportunities for that. 
really interesting about your academy too is uh, all the coaches you have. I know one of your jiu-jitsu coaches is Roxanne Modafferi, correct? Yeah. Former UFC fighter, right? Yeah, Roxy, the happy warrior. How did that come about? You we, must run into all kinds of interesting people in Vegas, you know, pros. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yeah, that's why I originally came here. It was an opportunity. But um, yeah, Roxy, she moved here from Japan to be on the Ultimate Fighter. It was a long time ago. So she ended up training at Syndicate. And, um, you know, we uh, always enjoy training together. And after I stopped fighting, some years later, she uh, decided to uh, start using me as a coach. I cornered her in one UFC fight. I can't remember who she fought. I don't know. She smashed her. It was awesome. Great memories with Roxanne. Great relationship. And when I left Syndicate and opened my own place, I always kept in contact with her. And I knew that it would be best for her career career for her to stay where she was and to finish it out. But I knew that she would probably consider retiring soon. So I always let her know whenever we met up for lunch or anything, say, Hey, if, and when you're, you're ready, you know, you have a home at tribe. I'd love to have you over there. You fit the culture perfectly. Even if I don't have an immediate spot for you, I'll create one. When she retired, then we, we were able to have that conversation. And now she's over there. It's great because uh, I just, I really love having Roxy around. She's just a great role model. And I think to kids and adults, She's a great model of what a whole person looks like. Her emotional intelligence is amazing, and, and she's the happy warrior. She's always smiling, and she and great training partner, too. You have extensive fight MMA experience. Has that sort of informed your jiu-jitsu instruction as well? I know that you also emphasize fundamentals. What I find interesting about reviewing so much of your work, I find a lot of like details that perhaps I haven't seen before or different ideas on fundamental moves. That's cool. Your thoughts on your jujitsu, the, the experience and the influence of your MMA background and everything in self-defense as well. I started my jujitsu with a guy named Jay Jack. He's up in Southern Maine, in Portland, Maine. He runs a gym called The Academy. And I think he's one of the best kept secrets in all of jujitsu and MMA. He had a huge emphasis on the fundamentals and holding people accountable through testing. By doing that, you're basically what you're doing is you're tricking people into training outside of class, right? Because you know, if you show up to class, it's one thing. But if you show up beforehand or after and you're doing some specific drilling based on some goals that you have, some short-term goals that you have, you're magically going to be better at jujitsu. I modeled my program after his template. There are a lot of the same techniques, but while I believe his is, is still more self-defense and, and MMA-based or no gi based mine, it has an emphasis on that, but it also rounds out nicely with sport jujitsu concepts. So at the beginning, we're doing a lot of wrestling, and then we're moving into negative position escapes. And then by the end of the curriculum, we're working on De La Hiva offense and defense and single leg X offense and defense, you know, stuff that you really shouldn't ever see in self-defense or even MMA, arguably. And I do that so they can kind of choose their avenue or, or see the different aspects of jujitsu. There's techniques and concepts that work well for self-defense and MMA, and then there's techniques and concepts that work well for sport jiu-jitsu just based on the um, the rules dynamics. So technique-wise, that's that's the stuff we cover. We also hold them accountable with the testing. We do that every three months. And so they're working outside of class, doing that extra work, that specific work. And then there's the aspect of the shark tank. When you're going for your fourth stripe on your white belt, the next time you test, you'll be testing over the skills portion like you have for the other three stripes, but then you'll also be participating in a shark tank if you pass the technical portion. The shark tank is 30 minutes of sparring with a fresh partner every one minute. By its design, you are set up for failure in the sense where you're going to be submitted. 30 different partners, right? Yeah, yeah, you're going to get tired enough, no matter how tough you are or how good your skill is at that point, you're going to get tired enough where honestly, like a child will probably be able to choke you. And we've done that before and it's awesome. <laughs> we'll send the kid in at like minute 28. But what I'm looking for is how somebody conducts themselves under the chaos 
of a fight, or at least as close to a fight as we can simulate while staying safe. They're rolling 100% fresh partner every one minute. They're in the bottom of mount. What are they doing? Are they are they turning around and giving up their back? Are they giving up their neck so that they can get tapped just so that they can get like a couple of a second break before they start slapping on the next submission? Or are they keeping their elbows tight? Are they bucking their hips and trying to get their partner to post their hands and resetting them? Are they making any attempt at all to do the techniques that we've worked? If they are, then that's great. Especially if it's like if you're in the deep minutes and you're dead ass tired, I'm just looking for you to be attempting to do the right things. I want to know if push comes to shove that you're going to at least try to save your own life and you're not going to just give up. You're going to fight until your heart explodes. And then that leads into our conversation about gameness, right? And that's another concept that was introduced to me by Jay. And gameness is is the concept of um, in dog fighting. When two dogs fight and a dog kills another dog, if you put another dog, another fresh dog in there with the with the winner, that dog's ready to fight. He's gonna he's gonna kill that next dog. And he's going to literally fight until his heart explodes. And though I don't condone dog fighting and neither does Jay or any, anybody, I feel like I have to say that. It's just that developing that gameness, developing that drive to never give up, no matter how much the odds are stacked against you, you must continue to fight. You must continue to try to escape, to try to fight. And if they catch you, they catch you. That's fine. They're going to tap you. I'm going to throw another person in there. They're going to smash you too. But if at the end of it, you've made a good effort, you've showed calm under the chaos of a fight and that you can you can do your technique, then I, I think you're eligible for blue belt at that point. You've showed me the techniques you showed me that you're going to fight if your life depends on it. And if there's anything that individual student needs to tighten up on after all of that, I'm going to work with them individually. But it just so happens that usually they don't. They usually have all their bases covered by then. It's 12 months minimum of very focused training. And like I said, before and after class, most of the time on weekends, a lot of these guys have keys to the gym. I'm trying to definitely promote an atmosphere where doing the extra work is not just encouraged, but it's normal. It's like expected if you want to have success in jujitsu. And I'm very transparent about that. If you want to just show up to class and go through the motions and then call it a day, that's totally fine. You can spend your time however you want. If you take the initiative, the avenue is there for you to be better. Just a reminder, to please give us a five-star review on Apple Music and Spotify and become a VIP member for only 99 cents a month. Get ad-free episodes at anchor.fm forward slash forever white belt forward slash subscribe and check us out on Instagram at forever white belt show. Go buy your forever white belt swag at teespring, T-E-E spring.com forward slash forever dash white dash belt. Check us out on YouTube now at forever white belt. Finally, if you ever get to beautiful Northern California, please come roll with us at North Bay Jiu-Jitsu in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. There are amazing instructors and everyone there are great people. Mention the podcast and get two weeks free. Regarding this sort of shark tank, you have different people that walk into your academy day one that are just all along the spectrum of ability and will. So you can have that person that just has that tenacity right out the gate and you just identify them versus someone who's just ready to fold in an instance. Yeah. You probably see that initial person go through, I don't know, maybe 10 people with a lot of vigor, whatever. And the other person, maybe at three people in, they're just sort of, you know what I mean? They're just wilting or whatever. How do you measure that? Because that secondary person, perhaps they couldn't even get past one person and now they're up to three. Is that a win And versus the other individuals? Or are you just calling these people out of the academy and they're just having to go somewhere else, uh, which would be a probably a nightmare business model, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll be the first to say that I don't think my method is the best way to gain all the new students and keep them on. I think it's a really good way to make somebody maybe who would have gone somewhere else, maybe I actually get them addicted to jujitsu. I think, you know, that same person, if they train somewhere else, they may have quit at some point. They might be somebody who really need that structure and they really need to know what they should be working on at every single step along the way. And that's defined on paper at my gym. It's literally like, here you go. This is what this is what you should be learning. Like a roadmap. It's pretty intuitive for somebody who has no stripes on their white belt. They're spending a lot of time on bottom. They need to learn how to escape. 
negative positions and they need to learn how to wrestle a little bit and they need to learn some basic submissions from every dominant position and like a couple of guard passes. It's very, very basic. Our retention is very good for that. I think a lot more people stay and, and continue to go for belts and, and try to get better. It's definitely not a turn and burn type of place. It's a more intimate experience. Is it a dance then, as uh, alluding back to that, those two different individuals that have that different type of will, if mm -hmm. you will, <laughs> in terms of coaching them, each takes a different coach, a different type of interaction with you or whatever coach may, they may be interacting with. Someone wants a firmer hand, someone wants a softer hand, so to speak. Yeah, it's true. There's different people are looking for different experiences. You know, I've had people tell me, hey, you know, I, I really, you know, I really need you to be hard on me. That's what I respond to. And I think they probably said that to me because my approach is usually a pretty soft approach. I try to gently coax people into liking jujitsu and, and, and encourage them and, and give them compliment sandwiches. But then it's really funny, like any of my blue belts will tell you that like, I flip a switch, like as soon as you get to blue belt, it's very different. I'll start busting your balls a little bit more i'll i'll say things like you should know this and things like that but really i understand that everybody needs refreshers and, and things but yeah i'll definitely you know start to treat them a little bit different when they start to come up because i know at that point they're very accountable people they've become much stronger and i like that kind of back and forth ball busting the atmosphere of my with my uh, upper belt i think that's a lot of fun it's definitely that kind of atmosphere so you touched on blue belt. Uh, what are your expectations of blue belt? By the time you get to blue belt, you should have a good base of wrestling. You should know how to do a good double, uh, single. You should have some basic judo techniques. You should know how to escape all the negative positions. You should have a couple of options for each of those. And there's the uh, the sport jiu-jitsu concepts. There's not just the techniques of like sweeping from De La Hiva, but how do you get to De La Hiva? And what does that mean in a tournament? And like, why would you pull guard? And that's another conversation too. So do you have an expectation that everyone should compete? I think it's a good idea for everybody to compete at least once, but it is definitely not a requirement. And I have plenty of students who have never competed, but I do think it's good to do. And it's mostly just because it scares you. I just have this concept in my mind. If something scares you or the idea of doing something scares you, it's probably going to be a growth experience. I really can't come up with any examples in my own life where the idea of doing something scared me and then I did it and I didn't grow from it. Obviously, there's exceptions to that, but anything like starting jujitsu or going into your first tournament or asking that girl you think you're, is out of your league, asking her out, going for that job that you thought you weren't qualified for, if you go for it, there's a good chance that you're going to get it. You got to put yourself out there. I think that's something jujitsu at its base level, that's what it gives. It gives us the courage to, to do scary things. Are you familiar with the ecological approach that seems to be in the zeitgeist of uh, jujitsu right now? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? And are you guys practicing that? Among the people who I, I like to watch is Kit Dale. He just came out with, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what it's called. His thing was great because goal-based training or concept-based training, that's something that I've been doing for a long time. I haven't put a label on it, but here's the thing. What I really liked about Kit Dale's thing was that he's reinforcing this idea that I have, and he's inspired me to do more of it. I think for adults, they're very capable of taking in complicated technique, like four or five step technique. And then, you know, practicing that technique, but you've got to give them an opportunity to do it in a live scenario. So you say you're working like half guard passing, you teach them a thing and you have them drill it briefly a couple times. Cause even Kit will say in the video, like beyond two or three times, it's, it's not going to like stick in your brain any better than if it's not. I think that's arguable too, but still, I think you got to give them the opportunity to get in the position and say, look, fuck everything else. Just think about, you're just trying to pass the guard and you're just trying to, and the bottom person's just trying to not let you pass the guard. That's it. Whatever that means to you, no submissions. And you can even break it down smaller than that too. You could be like, just free your knee line up from half guard. Bottom guy, just don't let him free the knee line up. I don't have time to do that specific of drills. I think that's the battle in my head is, is with an adult class. You have so much time. And uh, so I think a happy medium is good. It's, it's always done us really well with our adults. But with the kids, I've completely gone off the edge. And it's like 100% concept-based training, goal-based training. 
I'll beat them up for like 40, 45 minutes with those drills. And then we'll do some very brief technique where they're already huffing and puffing and they're fine with just doing some slow stuff for a second. And then boom, right back into live drills again to round out class. And it's been awesome. We've got new kids who have been training for just a couple of months and they're right up there with the kids who have been doing it for years. I think it's definitely the way to go with kids. And it's fun. It's just an active class and you don't get those lulls. And, you know, even if you have a small class, the kids are still forced to work hard and and stay intentional. Isn't it amazing how kids instruction has progressed, you know, since you've started, right? You know, I mean, kids classes and people take it seriously, even instructionals now you'll see and uh, people sharing their experience on like optimizing kids instruction. And you see the results of it now of who were kids like the Rotolos, let's say, or something like that, and what they are now. And you're seeing it firsthand, right? Your own kids and, and how awesome they're becoming, you know, and that's scale that across the world. I know I've got a three-year-old and he's training. It's amazing. Sometimes you think that they're not picking anything up. And then one day my three-year-old throws a Tai Toshi on, on some other kid. I'm like, I don't even know where that came from. We, we did that months ago. That's amazing, man. What's, you know, you've been in this game for so long. What in jujitsu has been interesting you as of late? Oh man, I love sport jujitsu in the gi. After I retired from MMA and started focusing more on the gi, I just realized how different it is. I love lapel guards. Keenan Cornelius's uh, lapel encyclopedia, I, I studied that and did a lot of drilling and started incorporating it into my competitions. And then I started teaching it. And I just think it's so cool. I think it's been largely overlooked too. And a lot of people have really slept on it. You know, I thought it was going to take everything by storm, which it kind of did for a while. Then it sort of faded away. It's a jujitsu culture thing. If you go to the comment section on any of my lapel guard posts, you can see more or less the divide in the community about lapel guards. Of course, you got the people on the outside of jujitsu who are like, this is the worst self-defense I've ever seen. I'm like, this is definitely not self-defense. I promise you, please don't make that mistake. And then you've got no gi guys who are like, this is why I don't do the gi, like this shit. I'm like, okay, like I get it. And then of course you got, you got gi guys who they think it should be illegal, that it's too hard to escape once you get to the position, arguably true. But of course you got people who love it too. I just think it's so cool. The way I look at it is you're taking all the jujitsu we already know, and then you're adding this new layer, the lapel. When you do something like De La Hiva, you can wrap the lapel around your De La Hiva side, and now they can't kill the daily heave hook anymore. It's attached. That's so cool. There's a little bit of a troll factor there too, where like the more people hate it, the more I'm like, ah, I'm going to keep pushing that button. That reminds me of like the, all the hate on the leg game initially or 10th planet initially and all these sort of illogical responses. Yeah, it's just jujitsu. We do it all at Tribe. We do heel hooks. We do lapel guards. We talk about sport jujitsu. We talk about self-defense. I think it's important to know the difference between all of them. And a lot of that can be like in a simple conversation too. Just like, hey, like if you ever catch yourself in this position on the street, don't do this, do this. Casey, have you ever considered quitting and why? No, I've never considered quitting. I've considered and have changed my path. Like with MMA, I quit. You know, I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. But then another door opens. I said, I'm going to do sport jujitsu. A lot of people don't know this, but when I was only six months into jujitsu as a white belt, I decided I was going to teach jujitsu and open a school someday. Yeah, I think that's pretty normal. I think a lot of people, yeah, I think, I think a lot of people in the back of their head, whether they're silently, you know, thinking I'd like to open an academy or I, I want to teach, you know, I think that's a, I think it's very rewarding for people. Even if you can give them one little tip, you feel a value. Yeah, absolutely. So that was always in the back of my head. Everything I kind of did, like including MMA was really just to tell my students one day, like, Hey, I've been where you are right now. I know the things that you're going through and, you know, I can lead you into battle with my experience. I have a hard time getting behind coaches who haven't been there. And I understand that some of those coaches are the best in the world at what they do. So I understand that you don't have to compete to be a good coach. That was a concept I didn't always understand, but I do get it now. I still have a problem. Me personally, I wouldn't be able to train under a coach who hadn't been where I've been. The authority goes out the window at that point. What non-jujitsu related media have you been like watching, reading, etc.? 
I'm very much into special operations type reading, whether it's uh, like the Jack Carr books or uh, just listening to like Mike Glover on a podcast. I just finished his uh, prepared book. It's only like a four and a half hour thing on Audible. I'm really into that stuff because I'm a little paranoid about uh, the end of the world. So I don't think I'm a prepper, but I aspire to be one. I'm trying to round out my skills. I'd really like to be more proficient in firearms and how to apply a tourniquet and all these, you know, survival type things. If I'm not learning about something like that on the side, then I'm probably listening to like a Michio Kaku book. I'm into like Stephen Hawking and uh, obviously uh, aliens. So, yeah, hundred uh, percent. You too. Yeah, yeah, oh, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Man, it's an interesting time to be alive. I can't believe people are having open conversations about it on the news and such. You know, it's incredible. What a time. I know. And here's the biggest deal of all: is the lack of attention people are putting on it, right? Uh, yeah, I think that even if they announced it on the news, which they kind of did, but really, really announced it like, hey, you know, here it is on the White House lawn is always the example. I think people would be all, whoa. And then the next day they would just be in, in traffic again on the commute, That's you the know, thing. thinking, how am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to do my laundry and all this stuff? You know, mm -hmm. you're right. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I believe I've said the same thing. I want to ask you, how can we train late stage defense? Say you learn how to replace half guard from bottom side control, and then you put the two athletes in the position, show them where to put their arms and everything, and then you give them a goal. Say, hey, you try to replace your half guard, and you try to not let that happen. You could give the top guy some technique as well, but then you're spending more time, right? And what's the focus of the class on that day? Typically, it'll be like one side of the coin where you're like, you're learning bottom half guard techniques or you're learning top half guard techniques. But then it also encourages the students to understand that you're not going to learn it all in one day and that you, you definitely should be consistent so that you can get all the pieces of the puzzle. Another cool thing about our curriculum is that it's 20 classes long the fundamental curriculum. So the students will know what class is on what day just based on where we're at in the curriculum. So if they're looking for a particular class, then they'll know to show up on Thursday or whenever that class is scheduled. It's a great way to structure the program, you know, and like any other problem area, like, oh, I can't sweep from De La Hiva. You know, I'm having trouble escaping bottom side control. I would, I would start you there. Now, we kind of touched on it earlier with the lapel. Let's talk about jujitsu dogma. What are like some examples of jujitsu dogma that you think about? Okay, here's the most important thing to remember. Everything works. If anybody finds themselves going to their coach and saying, hey, does XYZ move work? The answer is always yes. But everything is situational and you're going to have multiple options for that one situation. What is the best statistical option? Then you look at the individual athlete because we're mentioning statistics, right? So over the broad spectrum of all jujitsu athletes, there's going to be certain techniques that are higher percentage than others. And that's just because of like average body mechanics, right? Like a lot of men are 5'10", 160 pounds, right? And they'll probably have like a similar length and and limbs and things. So you've got the individual, their body type, but then you also start to look at more obscure type techniques. Even though that particular technique might not be as high a percentage on the broad spectrum, depending on how much you've worked that particular technique as an individual, your individual statistic may start to go up in that. And a really good example is something like a barimbolo, particularly in nogi. Nogi barimbolo, very, very, very loose position. It's hard to to control and over the general populace most of us will just mess it up so bad most of us can do a knee cut pass pretty decent I think that's kind of cool because knowing that and arming yourself with that, you can explore these areas of jujitsu and maybe even areas that your coach doesn't necessarily train very much himself. And you can start to be a, a force with those techniques that are otherwise considered low percentage type techniques. I don't really believe in jujitsu dogma, I guess. I do believe that there's techniques that everybody should learn. And I think there's techniques that are good to put in your curriculum because just based on the average person walking in, you want to try to cater to them. But then later on, after, after you get your blue belt, I think it's important to know that jujitsu dogma doesn't exist. You just, you know, you really need to pick that path and, and study it hard and work out all the kinks 
And of course, there's going to be trash techniques. Like there's going to be things that you definitely shouldn't do, but there's going to be other things like, again, I keep going back to the broom below because I've had so many coaches just unwilling to show it to me. And, you know, they're like, ah, oh, it's too loose. But actually the reason that I say this is because of the drilling habits I watched Mikey Musumeki and his sister do. I would show up to Dunham Jiu Jitsu some years back and I'd show up maybe like 20 minutes early and they'd already been there for a long time. And they're like drilling this one move over and over and over again. It's just like the basic broom blow. Just like breaking them down, inverting, broom blow, breaking them down, inverting. But it's going on for like hours. Going back to our conversation earlier about, I could argue about the effectiveness of like repetitive drilling because I've seen world-class people do it. I've seen them do it at like varying levels of resistance, like no resistance, lots of resistance and everything in between. But yeah, that was a big inspiration for me of like, man, as obscure as the technique might be, if you really nerd out on it and put a lot of attention into like the drilling and the micro drills, and then you put yourself in the live situation, you're going to start to work it out. Your media. You got Rock Solid BJJ Foundation on uh, BJJ Fanatics. You have something on Athletes Ocean, which I've never heard from anyone except uh, Mike Gemario before. So you're the second person. That I'm surprised to hear about that. And then um, some of my favorites is your your IG and your YouTube is fantastic. I mean, there's so much value there. I highly recommend all of you listening and watching out there. You gotta you gotta check out Casey's stuff on on YouTube and IG. Yeah, go buy his uh, BJJ Fanatics. But and it's so fun too because you have such a great sense of humor as well and the production is really nice you know too i provide value by slowing the technique down and just elaborating a little bit more than the average influencer there's a lot of things you could say about a technique so when i make a video i try to just think about some key points that might get some some light bulbs turned on in people's brains and i also try to keep it just over a minute i think if it's too long you're gonna lose people but I also think that just with my style, I think I like to elaborate a little bit more and give that time to slow it down. And then you don't have to be positive because I've definitely learned techniques from Instagram. And I've, def I've definitely been that guy on the mat, like trying to pause it at the right point and then redo it. You're wasting a lot of time. I know that I've definitely helped some people with that technique. And that's that's what's really rewarding about it is if you could affect at least one person and make their jiu-jitsu a little bit better through your Instagram. I think that's a win. And then your fanatics offering. Can you talk about that? What what is it? What can we expect? What can we get from it? The uh, Rock Solid BJJ Foundation is basically my beginner's curriculum at Tribe Vegas. There's more elaboration than I would do in a typical class. You know, some of these videos I'm talking for like five to 10 minutes straight. I wouldn't do that to a room full of people. I'd key in on different points depending on the group. I tried to design it so that if you've never done jujitsu before, we're not going to like throw terms at you that don't make sense. We're going to try to provide some sort of background on everything that we're talking about but i also think even if you're a black belt if you watch it i promise you that you're going to find at least a couple of things that maybe you forgot about or maybe you didn't put a lot of importance on that may help you with your own game or may help you teach that to somebody else i know that's a lot of what i get out of things when i watch it from other instructors is it's something that i already know but they teach it in, in kind of a different way or they have some different analogies and that stuff's great so Highly recommend it for everybody. I know you mentioned something about your transition, I think, from jujitsu to MMA, back to jujitsu. Transitioning from MMA, the big thing was realizing that this new beast is even further from a real fight than an MMA competition. Because of the, the rules dynamic, you have to accept those things to be successful with it. And it's something we talked about earlier, too, is just the concept of guard pulling. I didn't pull guard in a jiu-jitsu competition until brown belt. I never wrestled in my life. I never wrestled high school or college. All of my wrestling is done on the jiu-jitsu and MMA mat. It's never going to stand up to somebody who wrestled at a decent college, right? So my whole thing there is, uh, why wouldn't you pull guard in a situation where you know you're going to get taken down? It's a jiu-jitsu competition. Like, it's not a fight. It's okay. Like, you can do that. But there's a lot of coaches who were like, and a lot of culture that's like, no, you don't pull guard. But I don't care, man. Like, if you start when you're 30 and, like, you start competing and stuff, dude, you're going to go against some old wrestlers like they're gonna put you down hard and they might hurt you you know so just pull guard like it's a game and man like when i accepted that 
boom, I started winning IBJJF matches. This whole thing that I didn't understand, you know, I was trying to do an IBJJF, a one-off every year coming up blue, purple, getting my ass kicked. Oh my God, like, what is this thing? Like, I don't even understand it. And then, you know, you leave the building, you're like, well, if I could heel hook him, if I could punch him in the face, it was hilarious. I was having the same conversation with my student who had the most glorious reap of the uh, blue belt division at Nogi Worlds this week. You know, he's like, I just, you know, I think you should be able to reap. I'm like, yeah. And if you, if you could bring a gun and shoot him into the head, you'd win instantly. And that was the thing that made him realize like, okay, this is a rule set. Like, it doesn't matter what I want. Like, I signed up for this competition and you have to play it to the rule set. Even everything down to the advantage points. You have to understand that stuff because it's really, really important. And it doesn't matter if you think it's stupid or not. So Casey, if we want to get more information about you and everything that you're up to, uh, where should we go? You can visit my social media at Coach Casey Milliken. That's on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. My gym, Tribe Vegas. You can visit tribevegas.com. And uh, if you guys are visiting uh, Vegas at any time, everybody's welcome. Super chill gym. Just hit me up. Well, everyone, I'm your host, Adolfo Fronda. Thanks for another week of watching and listening out there. Remember to subscribe, like, and uh, check out our VIP thing. It's less than a dollar a month. Come on, you people. Buy me some coffee. And again, please. It's holiday season, at least as of this recording. So, Casey, again, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. It was, it was a real honor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. Okay, everyone. See you guys next time.